Welcome, welcome, welcome. Can I just tell you how good God's Word really is? You know, we sort of throw scriptures around and we kind of use them as trite, full sayings. We sometimes just use them as a, a, a standby or a fallback. But His Word does what His Word says it will do. And sometimes the smallest things remind me of that powerful truth. The last couple of days have been a little disappointing just from things and circumstances in my life, not me personally, but just disappointed in things that happened around me. And I was a little selfish about it, to be honest, where, you know, I was feeling sorry for myself that it didn't work out the way I wanted it to. And I was, you know, it was not going to be what I thought it was going to be. It was nothing major. It was just a disappointment. Well, God's word says, and I, here it comes, it's better to give than receive. Oh, no, it's better to give than to receive. We say that all the time. Or it's just kind of in that colloquial kind of saying, oh, it's better to give than to receive. And we usually do that with a sarcastic smile or tone to it. But we forget that God's word is powerful. So we have a, a few sober Christian-based, we have three Christian-based sober living houses in our town. Two for guys, one for girls. And I happen to teach Bible study at the one for the women. Um, there are a few, there are several women in the house, and they all come to Bible study once a week with me, and we, we just have a, an amazing time. God has developed a relationship between us all that is only divine. It is so special, and I love that time with these women. Some have come from very desperate backgrounds. Some just made some horrible mistakes. But all of them are, are loving God, serving Him, seeking Him, and they're rocking their sobriety. I mean, they're just rocking it. Well, today, as I was pulling out of my office, two of them were walking uh, down from the sober house, down our main road in the town, uh, toward our main street, because they had to go do something. I asked them if they needed a ride, and they said, no, no, it's a beautiful day, they're going to walk. Well, I handed them just a $20 bill and said, go get something to eat. Just go get, and it's funny because there was a $20 bill in my office that somebody had dropped into uh, what we had like an offering basket. And I just on the way out the door, picked up that 20 and put it in my pocket. I hadn't seen it. It must have been there for days. I don't always walk around where that basket is, but I happened to do it today, and there it was. And I picked it up, put it in my pocket, and I walked out the door into the parking lot, pulled out. There they were, handed them the 20, and they were so grateful for that $20 bill. I mean, they, their faces lit up. They're like, we'll, we'll go get something to eat. And I could see as they started to walk, there's a little, little kick in their step, $20. That's all it took, $20. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, see, it is. It's so much better to give than to be disappointed in what you didn't get. And my whole day changed. It just turned around because of that one little promise from God. So I just want to share that with you because I know there are a lot of us out there that get disappointed um, over a lot of things. But I'm telling you, God turns it around when we stop thinking about ourselves only and think about someone else. Little, little things like that, just tiny kindnesses can turn the day. That's how powerful God's word really is. There wasn't any power in the $20 bill. There wasn't any power in meeting them up, giving them a ride or not giving them a ride. The power was in God's promise that when you give, you get. You get more than you'll ever give away. Amen. That was for someone today because God spoke that in my heart as I was coming into the studio today. So I have a word today that at first glance you'll think, yep, I'm just going to turn her right off. It can't be for me. I've been there, done that. So I'm just going to go and turn the channel and go do something else. But I'm going to ask you just to stay with me. Because what God showed me 
through this one scripture, um, it's powerful. So this message is called, Just How Saved Are You? Just How Saved Are You? Now, the saving power of Jesus Christ is so rich and so amazing, yet in most of the Christian circles that I know, we've reduced it to just a fraction of what God intended salvation to be. In fact, most of us use the term, I'm saved, in the past tense. We say something like, I've been saved. I was saved. Or you ask, have you been saved? Oh, yeah, I was saved. Uh, when did you get saved? I mean, it's back here. It's always in back here that we got saved. And we relegate our salvation to a singular event that happened sometime in our past. But this is not at all what God intended salvation to be. In fact, this is the furthest thing imaginable for the true definition of salvation. Now, the Greek word is sozo, S-O-Z-O. And I, I taught a Bible study long ago. In fact, it's on, it's on our TV archives um, one brush at a time on the website. You can look it up, and it's called Why Live So-So When You Can Live So-So. Because the word so-so in the Greek is a huge word. It encompasses more than I can even share with you in a half-hour TV show. That's how big a word so-so is. So when God says you've been saved, you've been so-zoed, and so-zo um, is crammed full of meaning, and it can mean salvation. It's, it's physical and spiritual in its context. Um, it's to be kept safe, to be safe and sound, um, to be rescued from danger, to be rescued from destruction, to be healed, to be prospered, uh, to be cared for, um, to be restored, uh, both in health and it mentally, um, physically, spiritually. It is that big of a word, and it applies to both the realms, the spiritual and the physical realm. The word, I can do it this way, the word sozo, or what we call saved, um, includes the entire scope, the entire scope of everything that Jesus went to the cross to accomplish for us. He, he, wanted to, he, he went to the cross to accomplish our healing, salvation, saved, sozo. He went to the cross to um, assure us of our future hope in heaven, sozo. He went to the cross to reconcile us back to God, sozo. Everything that Jesus went to accomplish on the cross that he accomplished for us, that's what encompasses the word sozo. So here, here's the verse that God really, really um, lit up my spirit with. Romans 10, 13. Romans 10, 13. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. What tense is that? Okay, let, let me do it this way. I called upon the Lord when I was 20 or so to get saved, to be saved. I called upon the Lord to be saved. Okay, so I'm saved. Well, I called upon the Lord this morning in my prayer time. Well, if I called upon the Lord this morning, what is the promise? I'll be saved. Well, I'm going to call upon the Lord this afternoon. Well, if you call upon the Lord this afternoon, what's the promise? You'll be saved. I'm going to have prayer time with my prayer partner tonight. So we have, we're going to call upon the Lord tonight. So what's the promise? I'll be saved. I'll be sozoed. You see, we use that verse in Romans 10 to think, yeah, if you call upon the Lord, you'll be saved. That beginning salvation and, and that we're done. That's the event and we're all finished. But no, God gave me this revelation and he gave it to me as I was sitting in the parking lot praying, calling upon the Lord about this message. And here's what he said. Every time you call upon me, salvation comes to you. Sozo comes to you. Whether it's physical healing, emotional healing, whether it's spiritual healing, whether it's prosperity, whether it's um, something that God needs to deal with in you, something that God's working in you, whatever it possibly may, may, may be, every time I call upon the Lord, there's a promise of sozo. Praise God. Hallelujah. That is an amazing truth for you and I right now, that every time we call upon him, there's salvation. There is sozo.
Now, this work is totally his doing. It is not my doing at all. It doesn't matter how good or how bad I was. It doesn't matter if I'm guilty or full of shame, uh, full of doubt or fear, or full of love and compassion, and I'm doing great in my walk. It doesn't matter. But every time I call upon his name, earnestly, uh, salvation comes. That's the promise. That is the promise. Now, let me show you three verses that will demonstrate this. This is so exciting to me. And, and you know, I, I do the work in my office. I sit at my desk and I pray and I do a message like this and I type out the words and I type out the, the scriptures and I put it on paper and I come into the studio but God takes over all the time, and he gives me revelation as I'm talking to you, I'm hearing him, or if I'm sitting in my car and he's speaking to me, and this revelation is so unique, and so for us right now. So here, this is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith... And not this from yourselves. We didn't do it. It's a gift of God, not by works, so no man can boast. So it says we have been saved. Well, I can look back in my life, my, my spiritual life with God, and the countless ways that I've been saved. Not just saved uh, from hell and death in the grave. I've been saved from accidents and bad relationships and poor choices. I've been saved from uh, being hurt or sickness. I've been saved from my own um, bad ways. I I've been saved, and I can see the path of sozo and salvation. Because Paul says, you have been saved. In the past, look back and see what God has done. I see sozo everywhere in my past. Now, it's nothing that I did. It's the salvation of the Lord is all-encompassing. But as incredible as all this is, all the things he's done in my past, it, it is small compared to what he's doing now and what he will do. You see, salvation doesn't end with the sinner's prayer. It doesn't end with a walk to the front of the church and a few saints laying hands on you and making the decision to serve God. That's just the beginning of salvation. It doesn't end there. So let me show you the next step. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 2. 1 Corinthians 15, 2. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Okay, so Paul said in Ephesians, you have been saved. He writes a letter to the Corinthian church and he says, you are saved. Present tense, you are sozo. You are fully saved in God's eyes. Now, there is still a lot of work to do in Jenny Fister. There is still work to be done in my heart, in the way I think, in the way I react and respond to things. I'm still a work in progress, and I'm guessing there are many of us who don't want to admit that. But I know. I know me, and I know my selfish ways sometimes. And God is still working. But every time, what did Paul say in Romans? For everyone who calls upon the Lord, sozo is the promise. Call upon him right now, sozo is the promise. So it should be clear from the context of this verse that we are being saved. It's an ongoing process. The word for saved in this verse, it's a complex uh, word in the Greek, but it means a continual work. You are being saved. You were saved. That's what Paul said in Ephesians 2. You are being saved. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. You're being saved, being saved, being saved, continually being saved. So... I'm going to ask a question is what I, how saved are you? Are you just a believer who got saved back here and then you, you, you stop calling upon the name of the Lord or you stop letting him do the work in you and, and salvation was just an event back here? Oh, I hope not. Oh, I hope not. This process of salvation, though, there's an if in this verse, and this is key. It said, by the gospel, you are saved or being saved continually. 
if, there it is, if you hold firmly to the word. In other words, we have to have an ongoing relationship with Jesus. And if we have an ongoing relationship, then the promise of sozo is ours every time we call upon the Lord. I can't hammer that home enough. Calling upon the Lord is not a one-time event. Calling upon the Lord is a lifetime event. Over and over. You know, I think part of our problem in the modern church, in the evangelical church today, is our stubborn refusal to allow God to keep saving us. We, we are just content that our sins were forgiven back here. When we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, or we go to Sunday school, we go to church, and we might sing in the choir, we give our 10% of our tithe, and, and, and we're just content that our sins are forgiven. Uh, some of us look forward with hope and anticipation about heaven. We got saved here, and we got heaven here. Um, but here in the middle, there is this stubborn refusal to allow God to continue the sozo work in us. Right now, there are so many things that we want to do and experience in the world that we don't have time. We, we, we don't want God to disrupt our plans for life in this world. We don't have time for God to work in us, to grow us, to teach us, to conform us to his image, to be the potter forming the clay. We're just pleased enough that we're just a bunch of clay. We're just a pile of clay. We don't need to be formed. We just know we're on the potter's wheel, God's wheel as potter. We're, we're no longer on the world's wheel. We're, we're on the God as the potter's wheel. And we feel secure in that because we got saved a long time ago. We're yesterday, we're last week. And, and we know that God's, you know, got his hands on us. And sometimes he puts a little water on us to make sure we don't dry out. Um, and we're content with that. But that's not what Sozo is all about. The, the thought of God wanting to work in me is exciting. So we need to see God changing us as the natural growth of our walk with God. Certainly, I wouldn't want to be five again. Um, I can't drive a car at five. I can't go to restaurants by myself at five. I can't have adult relationships, um, good conversations with people. Um, I can't do, I can't go on vacation by myself. Um, I can't cook dinner by myself at five. And if I had stayed at five, yes, I would have had someone to take care of me all along. But I liked being 15. I liked being 25. I really enjoyed 35. 45, hmm, started to feel little crunches in my bones. 55, more crunches in my bones. And as I'm getting ready to turn 60, I don't even know if I'll make it to 65 the way this world is. But the natural growth of my life was growing. And not just going, okay, I, I, I'm a daughter of, of great parents at five, I'm gonna stay just like this the rest of my life. It doesn't work that way. And if it doesn't work that way in the physical, it can't work like that in the spiritual. His ongoing plan of salvation should never stagnate. It should never become stagnant in, you know, become stagnant water. It should always be a growth. So let me pull this. This is Paul again. Now we looked at Paul in Ephesians chapter 2. You have been. You were saved. We looked at Paul in 1 Corinthians 13. You are saved. Well, this is Paul in chapter 5 of Romans. 5, verse 9, chapter 5 of Romans, verse 9. Since we now have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? So there's a future saving. There was a past saving, a present saving, and a future saving. There was a past sozo. There's a present sozo, and there's a future sozo. There is an all-encompassing salvation. Not only is the saving work of Christ in us right now and active in me today, it gives me a future hope that God will not leave me halfway through growing. That every time I, the, I call on him, I'm getting more saved and more saved and more saved. And as I grow in my life and mature in my faith, I call on him more and more and more and more. 
all the time. And what's the promise? For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be sozoed, continually saved. See, I, I started out by saying I can look back and see all the ways of God's, that God's salvation restored me, took care of me, brought me out. And I'm just, just not talking, you know, physically. I'm talking all the dark days that I've had, those days of despair, the sadnesses, the hurts, the rejections and the abandonments and the disappointments, uh, the broken relationships, um, the brokenness of my body, you know, physically. And I look back and I see it wasn't a one-time deal. Every time I called out his name, the promise was salvation, saving me somehow through something for some great purpose. That is the power of salvation. And so I ask again, just how saved are you? Were you saved? Are you being saved? Will you be saved? Big question. The future does not fear me. Uh, I don't fear the future. I don't worry about the future. Why? Because tomorrow, when I call upon the name of the Lord, I'll be saved. Next Thursday, I'll call upon the name of the Lord. Whatever my Thursday brings, I'll be saved. Three months from now, when I call upon the name of the Lord, I'll be saved from whatever it is I need saving from. So let me give you one more scripture because this, this will kind of seal the deal. This is Paul, again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 10, I'm going to go through 15. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one already laid, which is Christ Jesus. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be revealed or shown for what it is. Because that day, that judgment day, will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. When we are initially saved, we are, we are placed on the foundation of Jesus Christ. It's afterwards that the building program begins. We lay the salvation foundation in Jesus. We have a choice on how the rest will be built. We can do it ourselves with wood, hay, and straw, and keep on building on the salvation foundation with wood, hay, and straw. Think about it uh, in the natural, that all over the world, these are the things that the world uses to build a structure hay, wood, and straw. They're used because they're readily available and easy to build with. I can try to save myself, build a foundation of sal on the salvation foundation with my own works, with my own abilities, or I can build differently. You see, it's a lot more difficult to build with gold, silver, and precious and costly stones. They speak of what's being built by the Holy Spirit. And if we submit our will to God in our lives, we'll see this beautiful structure arise on the foundation of salvation in Jesus Christ. And the structure will be a beautiful structure created by God. Not only that, but it will be beyond our expectations for what we could, we could have ever accomplished on our own. That's what salvation is all about. God laid a foundation for me when I first gave my life to God. That's the salvation foundation. Now, I could have spent the rest of my life saving myself, you know, just remembering that one event, but taking the rest into my own hands. Or 
I let God save me over and over. And he kept building and building with gold, silver, precious and costly stones. Every time I called upon his name and he saved me, he was building, building a beautiful salvation in my life. So I'm going to ask you again, just how saved are you? Is your house going to survive the test of fire? Not if you didn't let God build it. Amen. And so if, you're, if you've been building your house on your own, tear it down <laughs> and let God start to build. He's going to build something better. And how does he do that? You were saved. You are being saved. You will be saved. You know, they, those are big words in, um, in Christianese and theology. This is justification. That means just as if you've never sinned, you've been found innocent of it all. You are saved. Sanctification, you're being set aside and made holy by God. That's being saved. And then there's glorification. One day you will be saved completely and get a glorified body. Justification, sanctification, glorification, big words. What's it mean? God built a foundation for me to live. And he keeps on building on that foundation as he saves me every day, every moment, until one day it's a beautiful vessel. And he calls me home because the building's done, right? This is what God wants for you. He wants to save you over and over and over every day, every moment. So call up everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, no matter when, no matter where, no matter how. If you don't know this Jesus... Oh, will you let us lead him to you? Because he is painting a beautiful picture of your life saved with him, one brushstroke at a time. God bless you. Thank you for watching today's program, One Brushstroke at a Time. If you have been blessed by this study, would you share your story with us? We want to hear how God is moving in hearts all around the globe. If you have a question, would like more information, or would like to request prayer, please visit our website at brushstrokeministries.com or connect with us on Facebook at Brushstroke Ministries. You may also contact us at Brushstroke Ministries, P.O. Box 2353, Buchanan, West Virginia, 26201. Join Jenny Fister every week at this time to hear a fresh revelation as she paints a beautiful picture of his word, one brushstroke at a time.